available on SlideShare, so uh, no need to rush and take notes, just Google my surname uh, and look it up and uh, you'll be able to get it and all of the references uh, therein. Obviously, there's our Twitter links there, but uh, we play a significant role in COVID Moonshot as well, which is a uh, open source effort to uh, discover drugs for um, inhibiting the protease of COVID, which has been done at record speed. I'll mention this again at the end. Uh, we also do a tweet, I think, called Bucket List Papers, basically, for computation and medicinal chemistry, the 100 papers you've got to read before you die. It might kill you to read them all. So we tweet two of these a, a, a week. So it's a new way of following what we do. So uh, juxtaposition after Lewis is fantastic. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the same themes, probably in a bit more detail this time, and talk about further about what the chemist needs, actually, and the medicinal chemist needs uh, to be able to, uh, to do AI and actually address at the same time some of the issues that are uh, the AI systems and platforms are, are uh, occurring and, and how they occur when they start to interact with humans. So that means I'm obviously going to do what is explainable AI, uh, AI and thankfully Lewis has already explained a lot of the medicinal chemistry uh, uh, process and drug discovery process. I do have a, a chunk of chemistry in this one. I do have six project examples because it's a talk uh, primarily aimed at medicinal chemists to say, hey, there's all this AI stuff, what's going on? Rest of it. So I sort of adapted it for, for this video. But we're going to talk in more detail about how do you actually get new ideas out of a computer because that's what really uh, interests us. And it's getting those new ideas that's all about uh, uh, speed going future. And I'll put in just a couple of slides of a future vision at the end as well. So what is explainable AI and what does explainable AI mean to, um, to medicinal chemists? Well, you're familiar with the Turing test you call the imitation game. So if you can't tell the difference between a computer and a human, then you have achieved artificial intelligence. The definition we use is a system that suggests actions. Uh, you could choose to fully automate them or not. Uh, and so in additional human experience as part of the final decision making. Quite often, especially in our world of life sciences, people think that AI means machine learning. No, it doesn't. Uh, it can be any system that is suggesting the action. It doesn't have to be based on machine learning algorithms. It's just that they've come along and actually in a very readily accessible form that uh, tools like Nime that Lewis talked about earlier, but also uh, higher level programming languages, people get hold of these tools and actually use them. So it's not just about the data in GPU, it's about actually access to the tools more easily. However, the problem statement is, is if we produce models by some system, these are often called black box. And what's difficult for the chemists is that they can't get their heads into what's happening inside the box. They don't understand them where the models come from. And so can intrinsically not like them basically because they need to see. And so the key message from this is what chemists need, medicinal chemists need, they're able to see structures of compounds and the actual measurements. They need to be able to drill back as we call it to the real world evidence to understand at the point of decision making uh, where the stuff has come from. We find this definition very, very useful. And what Lewis talked about earlier in the message I want to convey here, we're not going to achieve artificial intelligence. It's nearly this elusive thing. Uh, very uh, highly intelligent, fully automated systems at level five are quite hard to achieve. Um, there are many systems out there that are fully automated and, and people can, uh, uh, can intervene. But a lot of what we actually talk about is semi-autonomous systems. So these like the auto trading stock exchange or even our uh, self-driving vehicles will be, um, be required to have interventions by humans. But brilliantly, again, what Lewis talked about is systems that do data entry and processing of the really mundane stuff and organizing the data that's quite simple level one augmentation. And what we're talking about in drugs discovery is often level one and level two. So again, that, that concept of tactical versus strategic thinking. And so that the humans have the chance to put in their really creative juices to it or go in different directions and, and almost guide the system. And so that's one of my key messages of today. We, we are, we're only talking about augmentation for chemistry. So again, building on what Lewis said, you know, the real problem statement when it comes down to it 
and this is the point I'll talk a little bit more about myself. I am a card carrying medicinal chemist. I, I did this for years. I was the same as Lewis. I trained as a synthetic organic chemist and went into the industry and worked on a lot of LI and LO projects and delivered candidate drugs into the clinic. I'm very pleased to say that I still do this, even though we are, are in our company. And by doing it, I keep fresh with what's going on and also fresh with what the needs are. But during the noughties, we had this crazy phase where we thought we'd turn the handle a lot and put loads of resource on things and make loads and loads of compounds and more drugs would drop out the other end. And it was rubbish. We just spent loads of money. So what we now want to do with that data which is leverage the data so we can currently spend in the LI and LO phase only making a few hundred compounds to actually get there. There's two reasons for that. Save time save money you'll get there uh, cheaply but you'll win the patent race and get to the clinic more quickly so we're one of one of these companies xi enters one of our clients uh, and we we uh, submit our enterprise system for uh, large pharma as well to be part of their suite so again here's a graphical representation of what lewis talked about earlier the chemist at the top is setting the strategic goals and making the decisions. And what we want is our robot, our, our AI system over here, um, to, um, um, to do a lot of this kind of, if you like, simple stuff and organization of data coming from a well curated database. So the database will be well organized, normalized, and within that, easy to get hold of data and actually uh, do pattern recognition. And what potentially the robot can do is make proposals, organize the information to a set of goals, and even do some degree of active learning and have some degree of situational awareness and kind of summarizing this for, uh, uh, and adding to the chemist and making their life easier, free more of their time to be creative. Now the problem statement, uh, you refer you to a couple of references here. We get excited about AI because they've been used um, and got out there in the newspapers because a computer has been used to play chess and beat the grandmasters or alpha go. Well, you can get can train a computer to play that game and produce a machine image that can play that game very well. And you could take that machine image and get it to play against another machine image and get two computers to play off each other very, very quickly and learn to be very successful at playing that game because the game is win or lose, true, false, zero, one. The problem is in drug discovery, but at the point the compound starts to hit clinic, there is still a degree of uncertainty whether the project is successful or not. So we don't have zero or one. And Worst of all, we don't have fully documented prod, uh, projects with all the compounds and all the measurements in them, even in large pharmaceutical companies because of the time and the expense it takes to test things. So for every single compound made in a project doesn't have a complete grid of every single measurement going forward. So that presents quite a significant challenge on top of the fact that there is uncertainty in all the data because it's biological data. So it does present uh, quite a challenge to, to Medcan. And also to drug discovery, again, because Lewis has already uh, alluded to, we have a design, make, test, analyze cycle. And in silico, drug discovery has been around for a while. So before AI came along, many companies were setting themselves up anyway to be experts and in silico drug discovery. So in fact, actually, the AI techniques are just an augmentation, an addition on top of these in silico drug discovery. And again, they're here to be part of analysis and design cycle and reduce the amount of times you go around the cycle by reducing the amount of compounds you make and test. So in terms of the numbers over here, it's an average is about two and a half thousand dollars per compound to make it and at least fifteen hundred dollars to test it. The further that compound progresses, the more and more expensive the, the assays become. Uh, I think the last study that I did when it was at AstraZeneca probably cost about half a million uh, dollars to do. It's quite a bit of pressure that when you get involved in that. Um, there are new machine learning techniques that are, are here to take apart synthetic chemistry and actually start proposing routes to 
uh, how to actually make compounds and how to make small molecules that could be drug. I'm not covering those in talks. There's a, there's a few companies that do that. I, I get those guys in to talk about that uh, as a process if, you, if you're kind of interested. But essentially, I'm talking about the analysis and the design phase uh, going forward. Now, what matters to productivity in drug discovery and what matters to medicinal chemistry is what is the next compound I'm going to make. You don't have the drug molecule for whatever reason. And if you knew what absolutely what to make, you'd only make one more compound. And of course, you get there more quickly and more cheaply. And the problem that's always been for the job in medicinal chemists that we all share is the absolute wealth of data that's incoming, just incoming. And all I'm doing on this slide is just illustrating how much data that comes in. Uh, and so this is almost your four or five Vs, volume, veracity, variety, and the rest of it come in and all the time. There's feeding into some kind of analysis and what to do next. And, and Lewis has already talked about that. Uh, how do we improve this situation and start to pricey this, this information down for chemists to take it in to make the strategic decision? But what I'm going to focus on is that actual design of the next compound going forward. And I'll tell you now where I kind of came from. First observation for the non-chemists in the crowd, sorry about the kind of chemistry, but let's, let's do some chemistry. Every drug discovery program, this was successful, this produced AJB 4996, this is one of mine. Um, you can almost summarize it in four compounds, which does make you wonder, why don't we just make four compounds? Why do we end up making 2000 compounds? And uh, in this particular area, we actually made 43. And if I could do it in less than 100 compounds any time, I wouldn't actually be talking at this conference. I'll be sitting on a massive pile of money. Um, but anyway, nonetheless, uh, this is the hit compound that came out of screening. We did a very, very rare thing and uh, yet to work out um, the AI way of doing this uh, because this is stripping the compound to its bare minimum. So this was actually a new compound that we made and tested. And by doing so, we understood where we are. And what this gave is the basis in which to build all the models that came from this going forward. So quite often when we're contractors as consultants, this is what we end up doing is going stripping back and saying, you need to make this compound. And it's difficult to persuade people to do because you lose potency. But in doing so, with structurally enabled, we're able to say we need a rigid compound so we could focus on rigid groups, which gave us this advanced lead. And it was actually this methoxy group here that gave the um, final candidate drug. Now, that last step, if you go to the literature in a certain period, once the patents were published, people thought this was the candidate drugs. Humans that are biased selected this compound thinking it was the candidate drug. It was actually this one. And the reason being is because they were on how that group of them metabolized. Now I put my hand on my heart here. The design, when we decided to make this compound amongst others was part of a set we were exploring the electronics of this ring, which sat against the protein surface. And we needed an electron rich group that was not going to interfere and have any molecular clashes. So this was the compound that was going to be right at the most electron rich end of the spectrum. And to our surprise, it turned out to be a really stable compound with fantastic properties. And last of all, it was quite easy to make the compound overall. So that got me started into going, despite the fact I designed it for one reason, I didn't predict it to be the candidate drug. So how could we go about doing that? And how can I overcome my biases? This is candidate uh, drug two for this project. Again, a great lead are rigid compounds here. This is one of the rigid compounds we made. Um, I'll, I'll go through it quickly uh, for this audience. What we found out of matched molecular pair analysis was that a one, two dimethoxy group was the thing to make. And we made this compound and it was fantastic. Really good bioavailability in rat and dogs, exactly what you wanted. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is the shape of the molecule. Again, data driven rather than biased human is not actually this shape. The lone pairs of electrons point to each, each other. We've already seen the picture. 
If you go to the protein data bank, 97% of structures are this shape. The electrons point towards you. Now, most of the models that people intuitively think of without doing any modeling, and particularly for medicinal chemists, would think it was the other shape. But once you've got this in place and you know its shape is like this, and you're getting these properties out of measuring it, you can start to design replacements for this, which overcome the other shortcomings in these compounds and get you to a candidate drug. And we also use matched molecular pair analysis to put this methyl group in as well. So this was an even better compound than the previous compound uh, going forward. And so it was this that got me into matched molecular pair analysis and got me into asking a computer to analyze large volumes of data, what they're good at, to build a database of rules of medicinal chemistry. So that what you could do is instead of this taking thousands of compounds, we could reapply those rules and do tricks like this again and propagate this knowledge out of this project to multiple projects. So that's when we were in AZ. And then we left AZ and started MedChemica to do this more seriously. So in the process of generating a database of knowledge, we now have a system that can suggest molecules to the chemist. That is a one system, and there's more than one, you can use to say to, say to the chemist, hey, how about making this? So the same way as like Amazon go, like people that bought these, bought these, is kind of the same sort of idea as that. So we're matched molecular pair analysis, and I will go into this in more detail. So um, I do need to mention generative smiles models as another technique of doing this. So you can take a machine learning or deep learning model and you can pull smile strings at them. So smile strings, a uh, notation method for representing chemical structures in organic molecules. And you can get a model to learn quite simply like natural language, the order in which these characters appear. And as a result of learning that model and building the, the extended uh, system of that, you can then say, hey, suggest compounds for me to make. Well, in their simplest form, they can do this in their billions. And that's been around for like eight or nine years now. So they, the process has been on. It's how to get this to now suggest sensible things to make. So quite often in med, we're referred to as the sensible AI company. Uh, by our clients because our software suggests sensible things to make. And the other point I'm going to make about, two points we're going to make about generative smiles models, and I'm not going to talk about them anymore. There's quite a good reference from Nathan Brown here that uh, came out recently. That's the first point. The second one, uh, I picked this molecule out uh, here. If you put this in front of a medicinal chemist of 20 years experience, they would go WTF, right? It starts off well, Ah, this bit's probably unstable and explosive. The bit in the middle is pretty good. And then it's phosphorus, boron, boron. What, why, is, why is this? Right. And this has just come because the, the, the model's just permutating the letters where it's seen them before in this order. There's actually the smile stream for it. So it's a crazy molecule. I don't even know if it's stable or you can make it. But here's my point. These generative smile systems can generate completely original ideas. This group over here, I have no idea whether that exists or it works, whether it's stable. How do we not know this is going to be the next miracle group, the next miracle group for binding to a certain protein class? It's going to be the breakthrough molecule. How acidic is this hydrogen? What is the acceptor capabilities of this in this, this sulfur ring over here? And that's why there's still, I think, genuine excitement in generative smiles models and how to get them to suggest sensible things, but also kind of looking over the edge kind of thing and, and really inspire chemists. So match molecular pair analysis. So um, extension of what Lewis said, we compare every molecule to every other molecule. And I mean every other molecule to every other molecule. So if you've got a million compounds, that is a million times by one million divided by two, the whole lot. And we see where there are well-defined chemical changes. So this methoxy group into a hydrogen. This is deliberately chosen because this will change the shape of this molecule here. So this, this allows the, this ring to flatten. Now, every chemist will tell you that it's the context of the chemical change is important. So we capture out four levels of chemical change. So we have an environment. 
then what we do is group on these and we do statistical analysis and put the results into a database. There's the references for looking it up. So I'll just do this in more detail with another example. CH2OH, CH2OH, one log unit difference in measured properties between these markers. So we, not only do we have a chemical match pair, but we also match because they have measurements for a property. And we can look at that difference and attribute that difference to that change in chemical group. Here's another match pair that are chemically different, but share the fact they have the same change to CH2OH. This one's 2.3 log units. Here's another pair, 1.6 log units. So three match pairs where the median value is 1.6. To a medicinal chemist, these suggest that looks like a good group for improving solubility. If we use stats techniques and keep our computer system unbiased, if we have six or more match pairs, we are at 95% confident that chemical change will improve properties. Uh, for this actual chemical change in our database now, we have 75 match pairs and it robustly improves solubility. It's a fantastic transformation for reducing solubility. We also know what that change will do to a whole load of other properties that will improve molecules as well. So we can do one of the hard things, which is multiple parameter optimization. The important thing is, is that we are based on real world data. So by creating the relationships between these things on a database, it enables us to drill back to the original structures, which makes our stuff explainable and understandable by the chemist. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into the stats on it because it's referenced there. This is how we create a knowledge database of rules that is then applicable as just the stats techniques. So here's that CH2OH here on this particular project. So I'll pack the talk with medicinal chemistry for medicinal chemistry. And in this case, it was used to generate AZP5363 and AKT inhibitor. This is in phase three at the moment. There's the reference to the MedChem paper. And this change not only improves potency, lipophilicity, improved solubility and reduced HERG as well. So it, this stuff works. The way the system works is we can also, now we've encoded these chemical transformations we came in the SMIRCs. It enables you to do knowledge sharing between multiple companies. And we did this because we knew we did not have the diversity in the data. So one of the cruxes for AI at the moment, though initially was the thought that there was lots and lots of data out there. There is lots of data out there, but it is not chemically diverse enough. And so we ran a consortium here to see if we can increase the diversity of chemistry and increase the, the knowledge. 437,000 rules of medicinal chemistry in there across the, the common assays that, that people have to solve out there. You can read all about that as well. I and mean, one thing we learned to ask about that is you can look up the most frequent things that chemists do. And uh, in essence, this is how they are summarized. Putting a fluorine group in here, putting a chlorine, anyway, the take home message, a lot of the things that they did, this is our chemists so it can be biased whether you think it or not. A lot of things they do actually make things worse or make very little difference at all most of the time, okay? It's not to say they don't work occasionally, but most of the time they don't. But what you can do, and the, and the point again made earlier, is with this analysis, you can find the counterintuitive stuff and actually pick out the stuff that really works. I'm sorry. Uh, I've got a business to run. I'm not going to tell you what the best heterocycle is to replace a benzene ring. I'm not going to tell you what the best mono substituent is because it's part of our database. But there's actually the real, real data from it. This is across a range of properties that is a usual thing for people up to optimize in the LA phase. There's a quote from one of our customers that they want rules that fix a lot of problems while leaving things alone because the process is really, really complicated. So our system's called rule design. You present a problem molecule to it. It uses the rules and it suggests molecules to make. As I mentioned earlier, um, like Amazon, people that made these, made these to fix their problem. Um, in a few seconds, it would be the equivalent of walking around your entire organization or, or going out there and asking for lots of ideas from people. And at the end of the day, it is only level one and level two augmentation of chemists. Amazingly. 
a study by GSK, Darren Green on the paper, they tried the Turing test using matched molecular pair analysis and the experts could not distinguish when another, another human was suggesting the idea or the computer was suggesting the idea. So matched molecular pair analysis kind of passes the Turing test. Uh, there's another project example. Uh, we helped this client improve their solubility to be able to go into an in vivo study uh, in rodent by improving the solubility. Excellent reduction in tumor volume here for this type of head and neck cancer. The time from AI design, synthesis, in vivo testing and publication, one year, basically, we could do that. So that's what we're about, helping clients accelerate. Because of the way everything's compared to everything else, the software can make big jumps. So we can take something like a T-butyl group and go straight to the, the right group to replace it with. Again, that's the idea of saving time and money. You could get there like there should be a crossing by going in two directions rather than straight across the middle. You can go path B straight across uh, there. You could get there. Guys at CRUK, this is what they did and were the first people to use our software. Replacement of the T butyl group with this group gave them the stability they wanted in human liver microsense. Sorry for going over that quickly. I just remind you the slides are available on the slide here for you to look at that in, in more detail. Uh, I'll skip over that example. That was another project we did as well to find inverse agonists. Uh, again, less than 100 compounds to get us to this uh, advanced compound here, which we put in vivo. Um, the idea was appetite suppression and what would happen with the rodents. This got CNS penetration, inverse agonist, would stop the animals eating for a period of time. And then uh, they finished that period, the drug wore off, and they would rebound and stuff themselves stupid. So actually, we partially got an understanding of the biological mechanism. So that was never going to work in clinics. So the point of this is, is that we failed quickly. Okay. Um, so back to one of those critical points, again, reinforcing the point that was made earlier, you have to make these interfaces work for people. I'll take this opportunity to completely agree with Lewis. Many times with biomedical companies, we've sat down and gone, we could do the full automated thing here. We could do this, we could do that. We could just have a server where you just turn it on and it, off it goes starting to do things. And most of the time when we get into pharma, why I ask Lewis the question, Pretty soon the conclusion has been, well, it's too much, it's too big a thing, it's too big a change for the culture here. Let's break it down into its steps. So what we do is when we say you enter a compound and you select a goal, one of the things about this is the chemists like this because they're still setting the strategy and the direction. They still feel like they've got control over this thing and control of the setting of it. Once you get that out, you get a lot of compound suggestions and a really straightforward interface to look at the idea. So this is the bit that people that tried to fix solubility, this is what they made. By the way, that is the candidate drug there from the AKT project is the third example that comes out. And a little bit of stats data just to get an idea of how it's come by. You can look at it in further detail with what we call the pizza wheels. So this is our multiple parameter optimization view that I alluded to. So you see a lot of green, you can see it's not only going to improve solubility, it's going to improve metabolism, fraction unbound, perhaps not for absorption though. So again, the chemist is making these critical decisions going forward and making the judgment in a, in a case of data. But here's the explainable AI bit. By clicking on top of those pieces, slices, you can drill back to the original data where the analysis was taken place of that CH2OH, and you can see the original measurements. We don't impute anything in MedChemical. We go off real measurements and data uh, to find out the rules. So they're all based on stuff that's really happened in the real world. And that point earlier, uh, <laughs> it does turn out for in these staging processes, you do need to get it into as few kicks as possible and worry quite a lot about the interface. We honestly didn't think we were going to be graphics user interface people, but we are. Uh, we're full into producing uh, well-designed graphics user interfaces now. And I think interesting is partly because what people are used to as well. They expect a computer to kind of have an interface and they click buttons, even though they complain about how many buttons they've got to click. So just briefly, um, machine learning models. How do you do explainable models of machine learning? So 
let's refocus ourselves on this one. As I alluded to earlier, once you get to some of the complicated machine learning techniques and you use more um, nuanced methods or more particular methods of encoding molecules as descriptors, by the time you've produced your model, it is the most darkest of darkest models that there is. Well, so when the chemist gets a prediction of potency or a prediction of toxicity or a prediction of any other property, where on earth does that come from? So inherently going, oh, I don't get this. How did it come up with that number? Because I look at that structure and I don't believe it kind of thing. I don't believe it's come up with that number. A bit so you'll have to trust me when I tell you that's me standing on the top of a mountain in Scotland. It can feel a bit like this sometimes. Thankfully, I could tell this was the summit because I could get my GPS out and check it. But imagine if I didn't have the GPS. What chemists want is actually, um, chemists want to be in this situation uh, where you've got beautiful views all around you and you can tell you're on the top of the mountain and which mountain you're on and see which direction to walk off safely. And you can do that when it's the likes of linear regression and substructures. So what we want is to be able to take the black box models and increase the clarity so people can understand how it's come up with the prediction. Because after all, at the end of the day, that's all the models are going to do is just predict stuff. So this is what we do with our machine learning models. We've taken all these data sets we happen to have cleaned up with all our match pair technology. That means we can automate the process of building multiple machine learning models. Off they go, they update daily, or if there's been any changes every week or every month. And we can present one or more molecules to this one and tell it what, what we want to predict, and it'll come up with a predictor. But more importantly, it'll tell us how it's done it. And this is what it looks like as an output. So here's an input molecule, an overall summary heat map. Red is hot, blue is cold. So it's telling you that most of the prediction comes from the core of the molecule. And if we break that core down, we can see it in its parts here. And that heat map tells us that most of it's concentrated around the middle here. With the numbers over here, we, we simplify the data here so that people can understand this is um, a four atom link between an aromatic group and um, a hydrogen bond. Um, oh, no, that's not, that's not. That's a, um, an aliphatic group, type of aliphatic group. Eight atom link, a four atom link here, hydrogen bond, etc. aromatic uh, group over here. So that's, the, that's our uh, double unit descriptor. And we can see from the numbers, we can understand where that that's come up with the numbers. What happens with chemists? We stop worrying about this prediction. And so all those F numbers and P numbers and trying to get, it all goes out the window completely and utterly because what matters is what you're going to do with the complex structure. And secondly, we supply a K and N model here. So 10 nearest neighbors here to the input compound. So that, and these are out of the data set we built the model from, the nearest neighbors from them. So this way people can go, actually, I can kind of see sausage molecule here, aromatic groups at either end, oh, I kind of understand where it's come from. So now I make a decision that it's worth, that's worth in investing and testing our compounds in the M1 receptor. Because if you hit the M1 receptor, you're going to experience toxicology, okay? If you make that judgment now, you can save yourself twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 by not having to do the testing. If you do get active, you've now got an idea of the chemistry and the changes you need to make going forward. Uh, so that's the builds on that to explain uh, those different parts I've talked about. So that's how we do machine learning models and we turn them from black boxes into actually something that's augmenting the chemist going forward. So I'll just finish up now with uh, future for, for AI in, in chemistry, uh, medicinal chemistry uh, going forward. So you're familiar with a genome sequence and we can do that now with automation. We can take cells, take the DNA, sequence that genome. We know from standing on the shoulders of giants that how a lot of those parts of DNA encode for different protein sequences and encode for different proteins that do a job. So from this, we can read this out and get a peptide sequence. We can go to a peptide sequence and we can get that peptide made if we wanted to, and that would feed into biological screening. Well, 
you can try and get a crystal structure, but even faster now is to do the likes of AlphaFold, which are just getting better and better and better. And now we have software to identify binding pockets within these structures. So with binding pockets, we can now do virtual screening and we're getting better and better at virtual screening. So rather than the days of high throughput screening where we would screen 3 million compounds, we'd wait in a queue of six months while the rest of the projects doing high throughput screening, we can potentially get this down to quite a small number of compounds, which means maybe only one or two people, doesn't need automated, we can just get on and do it, there are proteins available, and we can get our hit matter out and we can move into the optimization phase down our design, make, test, and analyze cycle and potentially do lead optimization in 100 compounds. I was rather amused when I put lead optimization into Google to get a nice picture and actually got one of my own slides back, actually, so I can't complain. So people go, ooh, ooh, okay, this is the future of potential drug discovery. Well, we have chipped away at every single one of these steps. First bit we can do, this is getting better, Binding pockets getting better, virtual screening is getting better. We can do screening quite easily for 10,000 compounds less, and we're getting better at this phase. So we can do this. As I alluded to with that Gorelin project, the faster you can do this with improved in vivo models, the faster you're going to fail. The faster the best compounds are going to come to the top. So you do have more chances of winning in the clinic. And one of the things we've consistently had pushback on is people saying to us, you're going to take my job away. No, I'm going to keep you in a job. Because by doing this cheaply and more quickly, companies are less, proposed, uh, less susceptible to fantastic failures. And big failures is what has traditionally resulted in people losing their jobs. Now, if this seems a bit too fanciful and it's not going to happen, well, we did this in COVID moonshot. So COVID, a target I do not have to explain to anybody. And you know the timeline of this one. So the, the sequence of the virus was produced and available to the world at the end of December 2019. Uh, this enabled production of the protein and crystallization of the protein structures that enabled a fragment screen to be taken. And the project released the fragments just as the first lockdowns occurred in March 2020. And they put these out there saying to medicinal chemists, hey, can we have ideas? Well, guess what? All of us involved in AI and stuff were kind of crazy on this one. And we very, very quickly went into the lead optimization with compounds. The project is now on track and heading to actually do clinical trials, kind of January, February, hopefully. So we're actually in quite a late stage at the moment. So that is an incredible speed from a standing start for just any project in any pharma, basically. Uh, so it's remarkable. So we are on track for doing just what I've alluded to as a future. And the processes of computers and technologies that augment these stages are going to be valuable all through that, those, those parts. So hopefully what I've done is I've, I've talked about what is explainable AID for the context of medicinal chemists. And we are talking about augmented intelligence, that level one, level two. And for us as chemists, it's really the substructure and, and, and measurements that explains what the computer's thinking. So that a chemist is better able to make the strategic decisions. And I've talked about designing those symptoms. And I, and I focused on how do you get a computer to generate a novel idea through the match pairs. I didn't have time to talk about permutated MMPA, but it's another one of the ways of doing this as well. Give us a shout if you want the full talk at your organization uh, and more details on the actual projects going forward. And hopefully I've given you an idea of uh, what we think the future is, is in uh, life sciences. Thank you very much. And just to leave you on the end with all of the hashtags and my email address. Uh, for last time, I remind you that the uh, slide deck is available on SlideShare.